Hi there, Dr. Carmen McGinnis here with you. Today we're going to talk about how to select and approach behavior change that you desire. Those things about yourself, those behaviors that you feel need to go or need to increase, whatever it is. Desired behavior change. That's what we're going to talk about today. Stick with me. there, Dr. Carmen McGinnis back with you. So there's something about your behavior that you are looking at maybe changing. You might have been hesitant to view this video thinking of past times that you attempted behavior change. Maybe you got in a week or uh, longer and then you changed your mind. Or maybe you accomplished your goal. You actually made some behavior change but it was really, really hard or maybe you ended up backsliding after your changes were accomplished. Yep, these are the three things that make behavior change super challenging. And that's what we're going to talk about today, how to overcome those three challenges. So the first step to accomplishing desired behavior change is to select the right behaviors to change. Some tips. Will it positively affect your quality of life? Sure, it's great that your mother wants you to lose a few pounds, but does it actually matter to you? It's awesome that your pregnant wife wants you to quit smoking, but can you see the benefits in this? And is it worth the pain and suffering along the way? Now, I'm not talking about pleasing your wife. Certainly, there's benefits um, in pleasing your wife benefits to you but it's very important that the behavior change you select is behavior change that directly benefits you not through someone else but directly so let's stick with the above example on this and we'll talk a little bit more about things will pleasing your wife please you of course it will if so, then there's an indirect benefit to you, as I mentioned. But do you share the goal that your child could be healthy? And if so, then there's a benefit that is directly to you. But I'm not suggesting that all behavior change desired by one spouse is of benefit to another spouse. That's not where I'm going with this. An example of this is a client who recently decided that his wife, this is a client of mine, that his wife should stop partaking of her two glasses of wine in the evening while she cooked dinner for the family of six and while she ate dinner. Two glasses every night, white wine. Because his boss, her husband's boss, my client, had gone into rehab. And it struck him, my client, that all alcohol is bad. It just blew him away so deeply that his boss had gone into rehab. His boss, who he never knew had a drinking problem, that he decided that all drinking was bad and went home and told his wife that she should quit. I talked him down, of course, after I asked a few questions about her drinking pattern. Point is... We should select our own behavior change. If it's not of value to us, we won't succeed. It's that simple. That is probably the greatest reason for failure of behavior change. Or another way of thinking about it is that we will succeed by failing. We will get what we ultimately wanted, which is to not have the behavior change because we will have failed at our attempt. The second trick to accomplishing desired behavior change is to ask yourself if it is doable. 
an extreme example for you. You may want to become, say, a heart surgeon after your best friend can't afford surgery and dies of heart disease. Very extreme example. But if you're, say, my age, and you haven't taken a biology course since your first year at university, and you aren't even very good at emergencies, it's probably not doable at all. So don't select that behavior change. In this example, you might consider readjusting your goal to something more attainable, such as volunteering, for instance, or even maybe getting a job with the American Heart Association, or if you're in Britain, the British Heart Foundation. If your goal seems too lofty, but you have a lot of motivation, then you can probably do it. I could probably go become a heart surgeon at my age, even though I haven't had a biology course since my first year at university. But do I really want to try to run that gauntlet? If you break your long-term goal in the sh into short-term goals, it might be doable. And then you have to look at, well, how much time do I have available to me to do this? I mean, you know, if I was to start studying to be a heart surgeon right now, I would be well into my 70s when I became qualified, if a med school even let me in at my age. So... So if you want to be a heart surgeon and you do have time, then the first step is an undergrad degree in biology. So let's say that you have selected a behavior that will benefit you. You've determined that it is doable or broken it into smaller goals that are doable. Your next step is determine the type of behavior that it is so that you can figure out how to succeed at it. Do you, for instance, want to reduce or extinguish a problem behavior? Or do you want to increase or get better at a behavior that's already in your repertoire? Or do you want to learn a new behavior? These are important questions so that you can come up with a plan. Some examples of each. An obvious example of reducing or extinguishing a problem behavior is substance abuse. You may want to quit smoking, for instance, or reduce your alcohol intake. Or it could be a verbal behavior, like you might want to stop cussing or being critical of your spouse or gossiping, something like that. Or it might be something very personal, like stop being a perfectionist or extinguish negative self-talk. An example in my own life was worrying thoughts. Used to have them all the time. Still battle that a little bit. And we'll discuss how I did it when we get to the how part of my talk. An example of increasing or getting better at behavior that's already in your repertoire is improving your golf game, for instance, or lengthening your yoga practice, something that I do. Walking twice a day instead of only once in the morning. Non-physical examples are making a point of making eye contact with people that you encounter. The barista at your local coffee shop, for instance, the doorman at your office building, or your co-workers. An example in my own life was improving my skills at visual arts. I decided that I used to be a good artist and I would get better at it again. So examples of learning a new behavior, starting from scratch, are easy to think of. Anything that you can't do, like learning a foreign language, for instance, for those of us who don't speak a foreign language, one that I took on a few years ago was learning to barbecue. I had absolutely no previous experience at barbecuing. Wonderful cook, but no barbecuing. So I decided to learn. One that's still on my bucket list is learning guitar. And on the topic of bucket lists, these are for behaviors that you 
might select, very important, by reserving them in this sort of holding tank, we can hold them out as possible goals that we might select rather than failed goals because we never got started. And I have a personal example of this. My ex-husband years ago knew that learning the guitar was on my bucket list, so he went out and bought me a guitar. And suddenly, how did I feel? I felt like a failure. <laughs> there was this guitar just sitting there day after day. It was beautiful, but I just never got started at it. But the reality is that he had selected that I should get started. I had not. It was just on my bucket list, and it still is. So let's now talk about plans. What will you need for each of these three types of behavior change? Let's start with the easiest behavior change. And these are new behaviors. Anything new that you want to learn is definitely the easiest. They're much harder than getting rid of old problems or increasing uh, something that's already in your repertoire. These are brand new things that you have never done before. You'll need to know what are your resources. These might include uh, available time and, of course, stuff, uh, which course is money, the money to buy the things that you'll need. And it involves reinforcers. In the case of desired change, like we're discussing today, especially learning new behaviors, the reinforcer is often in the form of that good feeling that you get from what you doing what you desire. If you're ready to learn to play the guitar and you go get that guitar and you start learning, you're going to feel good about it. And that's going to be your reinforcement to keep you going. But you might hit hiccups, times when you feel like you've plateaued or it was just too hard. So remember to reward yourself. Remember to give yourself that pat on the back. Rewards, or what we behavior analysts call reinforcers, are those things that happen while or immediately after a desired behavior. So an example, in, say in the case of learning a foreign language, an example might be um, pizza on the nights that you take your online Italian course. And you can eat it while you're taking the course or afterwards, and there's your reinforcer. Edible reinforcers are huge, very big reinforcement value there. The second easiest is behaviors already in your repertoire, which are selected for increase or improvement. The example we used earlier was increasing eye contact, and this might also include increasing duration of eye contact. You might literally say to yourself, nice job looking at the barista this morning in the eye. I even noticed his or her uh, name tag, Zach the barista, was nice. That was cool. Carmen, thumbs up. Good job. Well done. Now, if this is hard for you, if looking at people is hard for you, and I work a lot with people on the spectrum, so I know it is hard for some people, then you'll really need to notice the inherent value in doing it. Do people begin to treat you nicer? Is your coffee hotter, filled higher, served with a smile? What is it about doing that that feels good? Next and last and the hardest of all behavior change is getting rid of problem behaviors, either reducing the frequency of them or extinguishing them altogether. So let's talk. There's only one reason why you do these problem behaviors. You and these behaviors have a history of reinforcement. Something about them, doing them, was reinforcing. A very critical component to reducing or extinguishing problem behaviors is finding a reinforcer that is equally wonderful, or at least close. And it needs to fulfill the same function as the problem behavior. So let's talk function. There are four functions of behavior. Escape, access, attention, or sensory or sensation. Okay, 
So escape, access, attention, or some kind of sensory sensation. Using the smoking example, we might point to sensation and say that it provides a lift. We know that nicotine can be addictive for many people. However, smoking might also provide something else. And that is, I find when I work with people on this, typically that is escape. I've got to go outside and smoke, boss. Sorry, it's my smoking break. Goodbye, goodbye phone lines, goodbye work, goodbye everything. I'm out the door for 10, 15 minutes. Or, honey, can you bathe the kids tonight? I'm going to go sneak a, a cigarette. Ciao. This is just one example, this escape from, from whatever's in there to get to smoke the cigarette and pairing the sensation that we get, the physical piece, with the value of escape. But be honest with yourself when you figure this out. Whatever your problem behavior is, be honest with yourself because how you identify the function of that behavior is going to determine your success at changing the behavior, at reducing or extinguishing it. Now, I'm not suggesting that you don't deserve escape. <laughs> we all deserve escape. If it's escape that you desire, but we do need to know the precise function of the problem behavior, whatever it is, whether it's escape or access to something or just attention, we need to know the function of the problem behavior so that you can replace the behavior with something that provides the same function. I'll give you another brief example. A chronic gossiper in an office. This is a friend, not a client who came to me and said, I want to stop gossiping. It's become a problem. Uh, but I, I really like hanging out with my coworkers. Obvious. What else do you have in common with your coworkers other than gossip? They started talking recipes and food. The result was they all got on a diet and everybody lost weight as well. So there can be perks in examining the function and finding other behaviors that suit that same function. And this brings us to a typical mistake that people make when they, when they look at function, okay? So let's go back to the smoking example for a minute because it's easier to talk about it with smoking. So smokers typically decide to avoid the other smokers and stay inside when the other smokers go out for their break. And the result of this is that they no longer get their lift from the, the nicotine, but they also no longer get their escape from the work or the baby bath or whatever it is that they're trying to get away from, get a little break from. So they get nothing, and this is a big problem. So instead, I might suggest a replacement behavior instead of smoking that would accomplish the same functions. So in that particular example, it might be to have a walk to the local coffee shop for your break and you're going to get the lift from the caffeine and you're also going to get the escape from work rather than just going to the coffee counter at, at your job while everybody is outside getting a real break. So if it's a baby bath that you're opting out of, you might want to offer to walk the dog, something that has to be done instead of sitting on the garden wall, which is where you usually would have your cigarette. So you're not in the same environment, but you're getting the same relief. You're getting out of the house, you're getting away from the, um, the task of doing the baby bath. <laughs> I don't mean to make it sound like bathing the baby isn't pleasant. It is on some days, but we all know some days we would rather let our husband or wife do it. So, um, so that's kind of some examples for you today. I hope this has been helpful. Behavior change is clearly very challenging. Um, it's important that you select the right behaviors, that they give you direct benefit, that you identify how, whether they're doable and if they're long-term, that you break them into shorter goals. And it's very important that you identify what the function of your behavior is and come up with some replacement behaviors 
for that behavior that serve those same functions. So if this has been of interest to you, I hope you will also check out my online course, Raising Your Inner Child, which is also in book form, manual form if you prefer, paper, pen and paper. Uh, and I'll put links to both of those in the description to this video. I look forward to seeing you this Wednesday for my midweek sneak peek. Until then, have a wonderful week. I'll see you soon.